Good Wednesday evening to you. Welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study, River Bend Pentecostals. I am Pastor G.L. King, and it's an honor to be with you tonight. I hope uh, if we have some join us, uh, some that uh, watch later, but uh, we do thank you for being with us, and uh, we look forward to a, uh, a clear word from the Lord tonight, and we uh, Hopefully, you'll leave here edified and, and uh, perhaps even want to watch it again. Before we get into the Word, we've got a few announcements that we want to give you. Sunday morning will be online only. Now, we are going to be streaming from the sanctuary at the River Bend Pentecostals. Uh, we will uh, have the praise team with us. We'll have a time of worship and then the Word and uh, be a little more like regular church as we... Uh, uh, try to make our way back, so please tune in online. Uh, just be myself and the praise team that'll be in house on Sunday, and everyone else will be online. And uh, Monday night prayer will be canceled again. Wednesday night Bible study will be online only. And presently, we are planning to be back in house at the River Bend Pentecostals on Sunday morning, November the eighth. We will only have an eleven o'clock service. We will not have Sunday school as of yet. Only have a 11 o'clock service on November the 8th. And that is tentative. That is tentative, uh, providing that we don't have a, another outbreak of uh, the coronavirus among our members and our worshipers and, and friends of the River Bend. But uh, that is a tentative return date. is Sunday, November the 8th. So please make plans to attend. We will uh, be in touch with you. Uh, in the interim and we keep you updated as to what we're doing and where we're going and when we'll be going there and we want to tell you if you need us for anything please call us I'm happy to tell you that my family and I will be off quarantine in the morning tomorrow we'll be able to be back among the living so to speak so uh, please call us if you need us and we're available to help you any way we can we want to pray tonight again before we get into the word we want to pray for all those that are affected by COVID. Uh, we've had uh, two uh, new cases since we met with you last. And uh, we, uh, uh, fortunately, we've uh, had two had to go to the hospital, or three have to go to the hospital, but only one is in the hospital still yet. And uh, we're believing for a soon return home for him. Um, we do have several that are still very sick, but we also have more that have recovered and are at home doing good some are back to work and so the lord has been good to us so we want to pray for those affected by covid we want to pray for our upcoming elections and i want to remind you please go vote please go vote to your uh, respective polling places please go and cast your vote prayerfully scripturally and biblically in line with biblical values and principles However you see that, we want you to vote. We don't tell you how to vote, tell you who to vote for. All of you are intelligent adults. You can do that on your own, but please go and vote. We need to pray over it and be, vote prayerfully. We want to pray for our church. Our church has uh, not been able to be together now for a couple of weeks, and, uh, and we won't be for another week or so, week and a half. So we want to pray for our church, pray for our people that don't have Facebook and don't have a way to stay connected. Try to connect with them if you can. Uh, we want to stay connected throughout this time. We're expecting to be back together. And Lord willing, by about the 1st of December, we'll be back in Sunday school and uh, going full board by the help of the Lord. If you have any requests that you'd like for us to pray over, uh, you can send them in in the comments. And uh, we'll be happy to pray over them if we can see them, if we can catch them. If not, we'll pray over them at a later date. But we ask that you pray with us right now as we bind together. Let's pray for this, this gathering tonight. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we pray for those whose lives are negatively affected by this COVID virus. We pray for those that are still struggling with their health and we're struggling with the outlying medical conditions that have been exacerbated because of this illness. I pray, God, for those in the hospital, those that have had to be hospitalized, those that are unable to get out. Pray for those that are just now starting back to work. Pray you'll give them strength. 
Pray, God, that we don't have any new cases. Pray, Lord, that those that are just coming down with the virus, that you'll just let it pass through their life quickly. I pray, God, for our upcoming elections. I pray for our leadership. I pray, Lord, that your will is done. Lord, you set up kings and you take down kings. You set up thrones and dominions and you take them down. We trust you, Lord, that you're going to lead us in the right direction. Every Christian, every Holy Ghost-filled believer, let them be led by the Spirit and not by the flesh. I pray, God, that there's safety. I pray, Lord, that we remain uh, as neutral as we can as far as uh, uh, getting involved in any conflicts. We don't want to do that. We just want to vote with our conscience and vote with the Spirit. So I pray, God, that the, that the elections, the upcoming elections, go smoothly and that your will is done. I pray for our church. I pray for those that are negatively affected by the virus. I pray that we're not that uh, those that are not able to stay connected are able to get connected. I pray, Lord, that our prayer lives and our fasting and our Bible reading have not been hindered by this. And if they have, let us make a new commitment and a new effort to uh, stay established in the godly disciplines that keep our flesh under subjection and keep us on track. I pray, Lord, for the Bible studies we're getting an opportunity to teach. I pray, Lord, that you will lead us, direct us, guide us, anoint us, let your spirit be in us, because it's not by might nor by power, but by your spirit that all of this is going to come to pass. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. We also want to uh, now let remind you of our evening offering and tithing. Uh, you can use the GiveLify app. Uh, which many do. Many use it very successfully. We've had little or no problems with it. Uh, then we have our PayPal account that you can use through our website, which is riverbendpentecostals.com. And then we have a post office box that you can mail your tithing and offerings into, P.O. Box 477, New Madrid, Missouri, 63869. And then, of course, if you want to bring it by, we've had it brought by and left in the storm door. We've had it left uh, in the mailbox. Uh, if you're going to bring cash, please let us know about it so that we're able to pick it up quickly. And then if you would like for us to come pick up your tithing or your offerings, you just call or text and we will come and pick them up for you. We uh, do commend you again for your continual faithful giving to the kingdom of God. And uh, we, uh, we have held on good. Our giving has held on good, but we need to continue we do not know what the future holds, and we've got to, to stay faithful in our consecration and commitment to giving. Let's get into the word of the Lord tonight. Uh, I uh, almost promise you that you've never heard this lesson taught or this scripture taught like I'm going to teach it tonight. I have never taught it this way, never even really seen it this way, and wasn't wasn't even looking for this, to be honest with you, when I began to study today. And uh, <clears throat> we certainly hope that we're clear when we share it with you and that the word of the Lord is able to minister to you. Before I delve into this, before I even tell you where I'm going in the word, I want to make this statement. This scripture does not provide for one to be brought before the church and made a public spectacle of. This passage does not in any way encourage a public airing of anyone's failure. And in fact, the failure is not the focus. And that's something that I want to, to uh, really focus and really stress. Failure cannot be the focus of the church, but victory over failure is the focus of the church. Uh, we are not calling the church to begin to hunt people down and express our faults and our failures to them but we're talking about creating a culture of trust and a culture of unity and a culture that is like Jesus Christ. And I think you'll see as we get into the word um, where we uh, glean that thought and that warning from. James chapter 5 and verse number 16 says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now the first part of this passage paints a picture of an idealistic unity that is built on trust and mutual respect and awareness that says none of us are perfect, but we want to be. None of us are holy, but we want to be. 
look at it. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. That uh, brings up all kinds of thoughts of fear and all kinds of thoughts of uncertainty. And, and uh, there are, uh, uh, cert so it's like a minefield when you talk about confess your faults one to another. Now, we have to keep in mind that the culture of the Jews, the book of James is probably the earliest book written in the New Testament. It was, uh, as far as uh, chronologically speaking, the earliest book, the first book of the New Testament. So James is writing to a, a, a new church, a new body of believers, Holy Ghost filled, repented, water baptized in Jesus' name, but they still live under the shadow, if you will, of the law. Now, this is a formula. I want you to think of James 5.16 as a formula that moves us from a culture that is enamored with failure, which the law was. Hebrews 7 and 19 says the law made nothing perfect or the law made nothing better, but the bringing in of a better hope did. The law, I believe it's Romans chapter number 5, said under the law the offense is the focus. The, the offense abounded under the law, but grace came and uh, that, that mercy and righteousness might abound. So under the law, the failure, the offense was the focus. If you do this, then this is the ramification for it. And very little was offered in the way of incentive for success or for doing right. But we want to move from a culture that is enamored with failure to a culture that is focused on restoration and reconciliation, which is a characteristic of Jesus Christ in the ministry of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says, To wit God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Jesus Christ wanted to bring the world back to him. God brought the world back to him through Jesus Christ, through the man Christ Jesus. And it also ends that he is committed unto us the word of reconciliation. We are a church that believes in restoration. We are a church that practices restoration and reconciliation and restoring people to a relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me be clear. We cannot under any circumstances go around to just anyone sharing our faults with them. But it is a desirable culture of where we can trust our brothers and sisters with our faults and we can trust them to pray with us that we might be healed. Look here, we have to have an eye toward fulfilling the promise of the scriptures that says that you may be healed and that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Just look at this. Confess your faults one to another. Now, it denotes a mutual sharing, but it is not, and we fall into this trap sometimes, it is not that when somebody comes to you with a failure or with a fault that you have to offer them one that, that helps them feel better about themselves. It doesn't mean that when we come that it's always going to be, I got a fault, you got a fault, let's share them. But perhaps it'll be on day one, it'll be me come to my wife, and then day two be my wife come to me. But the solution is still the same that we pray one for another. It doesn't have to be at the same time over the same fault. It's not a tit for tat. It's not a conversation when we get together, but it is an awareness that I have some things that I'm struggling with. I have some failures, some faults, some sin in my life, but I don't want it to be there. I want to get it right. And this is a, a formula whereby we can be healed from the effects of sin. And I got a little ahead of myself right now. Please forgive me for that. But this is not repentance toward each other necessarily, though it can be. You can go to somebody and say, I've done you wrong. I need help. I've got a fault, and I need you to help me. But it's more of an accountability relationship where neither of us want to be the servant or the victim of sin. I have some situations in my life, or I have some struggles in my life, and I want to get the victory over them. So I have an accountability partner. I have somebody that I trust that I go to, and I tell them, hey, I've got a problem in this area. And our response is always going to be, let's pray for it that we may be healed. Now, that's a very uh, unique way of looking at the sin problem in with the uh, terminology of healing. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Now we understand that verses 14 and 15 of this same chapter deal expressively with the healing of physical sickness. So it would seem that verse number 16 deals with healing is dealing with the effects of sin or the sins 
and the effect that that sand has had upon an individual. Anyone that's lived very long knows that when you when you fail or you sin or you have a fault in your life, often there are ramifications that that lead to home problems, work problems, life problems of any any uh, uh, description or any type. And this would seem to to lead us to the fact that that mutual respect and trust where we care for one another and we share with one another our difficulties and our problems, that we pray together and there will be healing come because over the effects of that sin or that fault or that failure, healing will come to our life. So it's an incredible concept that the pattern that is given to us is the same pattern of Jesus Christ. We're going to bring that to your attention in just a minute. But the second part of verse number 16 says, remember the first part says, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Then it says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man would seem to refer to those who have first confessed their faults and been healed. The blood of Jesus, the power of the Holy Ghost, heals us and, and delivers us from the effects of sin in our life. And uh, it would uh, be uh, pointing toward those who have first confessed their faults, prayed over them, and then have been healed. Now understand that this is a, a far stretch from what is normal when you begin to talk about people's failures and faults. I, I don't even know right this moment. I'm sure it's the case, but right this moment, who can I trust with my failures? Who can I trust with my faults? But somebody hearing this word right now needs to make it a matter of prayer focus that you can become someone that people can trust you with their failures and with their faults and that you will pray with them, not take them to somebody else and talk about them, but that you'll pray with them because we want to be healed. We want to be delivered. We want to be set free from the effects of sin because God has something for us and sin is holding us back. Sin is a yoke that is holding us back. I was thinking about uh, uh, the, the uh, 10 lepers that uh, the Lord healed. And all 10 of them were healed, but only one came back to praise him for it. And there was a difference. That's the point I want to make to you is there were 10 lepers, nine were healed, but one was made whole because I'm, I'm thinking perhaps that this scripture is leading us to the, their people are delivered from sin. The, 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 the sin is gone. It's no longer effective in their life, but the Lord is leading us to a formula whereby we can be delivered from the effects of sin. There's probably no one among us that hasn't made a bad decision decision in your life and then reap the benefits of it. And I've used benefits in quotes, but I believe the Lord has given us a formula where we talk about things. We don't keep them inside. We talk about them and together we pray and God will heal. God will heal our lives from the effects of the sin that has, that has come upon us and upon our family. Now, everybody can be set free from sin. But here's a, a pathway whereby we can seek for healing from the effects of those sins upon our life. Um, one translation used the words regarding this prayer when it says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. One translation says, calls that prevailing prayer. And I looked it up in the Greek, and that means to have strength, to be strong, in full health and vigor, to have force. Now think about this. Uh, the Bible tells us in more than one place, but one in particular comes to my mind about our prayers being hindered. And I'm thinking during this time that we're in right now, prayer is going to be a security blanket for us. Prayer is going to be something that we can hold on to, that we can do any place, anytime, even away from the house of God. But I am feeling like the Lord is leading us to a place where he says, confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. Then the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much or prevails. It has strength. It's full. I am submitting to you that perhaps to uh, talk, get our thought, thoughts and failures out in the open and pray over them and get healing from them that the effects of that healing is noted in our prayer because our faith has increased because God has healed our lives and now our prayer, the magnitude of our prayer is more effective it is healthy, it is in full health and vigor, it has force it has power, we are no longer praying uh, reactively but proactively and we're no longer praying to survive but we're praying victory prayers Look, this unified, I hope 
goodness, I'm being clear. This unified, coming together, uh, confession and praying, healing prayers aligns us with Jesus Christ. He came for the express purpose of delivering us from the power of sin, to seek and save that which was lost. For God so loved the world that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Sin separated us from God. Jesus Christ came and on the cross of Calvary paid the price where sin has no dominion over us. He came to deliver us from the power of sin. And when we come together unified and pray together for us to be healed from the effects and the power of sin, we are aligning ourselves with the purpose of Jesus Christ. And when we do that, we have through obedience to the scriptures aligned ourselves with the purpose and the desire of Calvary. And the evidence of our healing is the loosening of our prayers from being defensive and reactive prayers to being offensive. And I say that in a, in a perhaps a football context uh, where we're now going on the offensive in our prayers uh, against the powers of the enemy rather than defensive. And no longer are we reactive to the things that's happened in our lives, but now we're praying proactive prayers because we have, our lives have been healed. We've gone from survival praying to triumphant, victorious praying. And it happened because we begin to be more like Jesus uh, and we come together and we can share our faults and we can share our failures and our weaknesses and our problems and our troubles and we don't keep them pent up inside of us where we get angry and we get uh, uh, wrapped up in the idea of being a victim and nobody cares because the Bible very clearly says ironically enough in the book of James if there's any sick among you let them call from the elders of the church. Nobody knows what you're going through like you are and somebody right now is going to begin to pray Lord, make me be trustworthy. Let me be the one that we can come to and they can share faults with me. And right then, we will pray over them and we will perhaps have a few days of prayer and fasting as we begin to heal from the effects of sin and failures and faults. The wages of sin is death. Sin brings problems. But the Lord made us an avenue through the mutual respect and unity and trust where we can come and share our failures and our faults and pray to together that we be healed. There's power in unity and power, and we come together as a unified body and be like Jesus Christ. Now, it's not our righteousness that we seek, that effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. It's not our righteousness, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And the righteousness of, the righteousness of Jesus Christ is no better displayed than on Calvary. He, be, he became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. And once again, we're given a pattern in the scripture that says, confess your faults one to another. I know that scares us to death, but we begin to be prepare ourselves for folks to go. We're not talking about everybody get together and have a, have a fault fest. We're talking about people that have, have lived their lives and have carried the weight of sin and the weight of guilt on them and God wants to heal you because your prayers have been uh, survival prayers. Your prayers have been trying to dig out of a past that's maybe 5, 10, 15, 20 years in the past and, and you every day of your life you look in the mirror and see the effects of that sin and I'm telling you God wants to heal you. God wants to heal you. Everybody's forgiven but not everybody is made whole. Nine lepers were made whole, were, were cleansed but only one was made whole. I'm telling us tonight, I'm calling of this church to an awareness uh, that the Bible says uh, confess your faults one to another. Let's stop hoarding this stuff up. Let's stop, stop carrying these burdens around. I believe I'm talking to somebody that you've been carrying a burden perhaps your whole entire life. Uh, and I want you to know the Lord is going to put somebody in your path uh, who you can open up to about these things, uh, who you can begin to pray with about these things. Uh, and God is going to heal your life uh, and your home and your mind and your heart through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. This is not the way of the world, but it's the way of Jesus. Confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You will accomplish much through prayer once you have been healed, once your life has been healed. That righteousness was exemplified in John chapter number eight, that righteousness of Jesus Christ. It was exemplified. What I'm sharing with you today is exemplified in John chapter number 8, verse number 11. When given the opportunity to condemn the adulterous woman, Jesus chose to forgive her. 
Her sin was out in the open. That's the confession part. Her sin was out in the open. Now, we understand she didn't confess her sin, but she was busted in the very act of adultery. So her sin was in the open, and Jesus chose to forgive her. He said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. It was that consistent attitude that drew sinners to Jesus. Not that they might corrupt him. He wasn't afraid that when he ate with sinners and publicans and when he, when he hung out with sinners and publicans and when they came to him Jesus wasn't afraid that they were going to corrupt him nor draw him into their lives that's not why they were there they he wasn't looking to be the cool guy in the lunchroom he wasn't looking to be the big man on campus they were looking for him but because in him they found inspiration and hope and not condemnation their sins weren't magnified but their potential was when they came to Jesus now look at Zacchaeus or Zacchaeus in Luke chapter number 19, he was drawn to Jesus. The Bible said Jesus was coming to Jericho and Zacchaeus wanted to see him, but he was short of stature and he couldn't see over the crowd. So he ran ahead of him and he got on the path that Jesus was coming and he climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. You remember that song from Sunday school, I'm sure. Zacchaeus was a rich publican which publicans were Jews hired by the Romans to be tax collectors. So he was, in essence, a traitor to his people. And he cheated folks out of extra tax money and lined his pockets. Whatever he could get over and above the regular tax, he was able to put that in his pocket. But uh, he had a desire to, to see Jesus. Now think about that. What a desire. He had no right. He had no hope. He, he really wasn't there to be changed. He just had a desire to see Jesus. I would submit that that desire is in each and every one of us. And it was there in that tree, up a tree, that Zacchaeus was found by Jesus. And he stopped under the tree, the Bible says, Luke chapter 19, and he called Zacchaeus down. He didn't just say, hey, fella, come down. He called him by name. He said, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at your house. Zacchaeus was there to see Jesus. Jesus made himself available to Zacchaeus, and they came together. The crowd started murmuring. Here we go. Confess your faults one to another. Who can, be, who can you trust with your failure? The crowd started murmuring against Jesus and said, Looky there, he goes to, to be in the house with a sinner. Jesus wasn't even one bit concerned about it because he came to seek and save that which was lost. But as Zacchaeus come out of the tree, now think about this. Zacchaeus come out of the tree and he stood before Jesus immediately. I felt this so strongly when I prepared this today and I, I feel like a Holy Ghost goosebumps all over me. Immediately, Zacchaeus started confessing and repenting. Not because he felt condemned by Jesus, but just the opposite. He was inspired by Jesus. He was inspired by being in the presence of the Lord. Inspired to repent. Inspired to change. That's the plan of God. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. We're supposed to come together, and we're not coming together and confessing our faults because we busybodies and want to know people's faults. We're coming together because we need to know what they need to pray to be healed of because we are uh, not looking at the failure, not looking at the fault, not looking at the offense, but we're looking at the person they can be once they're delivered and healed by Jesus Christ. Zacchaeus was drawn to Jesus. We have to create ourselves. Uh, let the Holy Ghost make us into somebody that folks can come to and share their problems, but not that, that we want to carry everybody's load and not that we want to carry everybody's failure, but it's going to come to us and it's going to die with us because we're going to pray together and there's going to be healing. And when there's healing, both of our prayers are going to be, the power is going to be increased because we're going to have the victory over the sin that has carried us so much of our lives. I feel that, that this is a part of the goal that James aspires to for the church, is to be inspired by one another, recognizing that the righteous and the unrighteous find hope in the same place, recognizing always that such were some of us. I think it's important and powerful that we begin to prepare ourselves to be trusted with somebody's failure, 
not to be a busybody, not to be a dear Abby. We're not looking for that. We're not looking for that. We got enough of those kind of people running around, but we need people that will take them to the Lord together and we can be healed. Remember, I told you the, a few services ago, and I've reminded us a couple of times, how can I help you? It's got to be the theme on the lips and the mind of every member and every worshiper of the river bend. It's got to be the mantra of our church. How can I help you? That A ministry that reflects Jesus Christ. And we're known as disciples because we have love one for another. we got to seek to become the one that others can trust with our failures. We've got to seek to trust. we got to seek for the Lord to put people in our path. There's a camaraderie. There's a unity. We can be bound together. Mary Magdalene, out of whom was cast seven devils. You couldn't get beat her away from Jesus Christ. You couldn't get her away from the Lord. She wanted to be with him. And there's a unity that is birthed when we pray together over failure and we find healing and we find deliverance. We've got to be one that can be trusted with failures. We've got to also trust others. That's a part of who the church is is getting victory over sin. We'll share it. We'll pray together that we may be healed, and it's got to die with us. We can't go and repeat a matter. That's against the Bible. We can't uh, use people's failures and faults against them. That's the work of the devil. But the Lord came to seek and save that which was lost. He didn't magnify that woman's failure. He didn't magnify Zacchaeus' failure. He never said anything negative to Zacchaeus except, I want to hang out with you today. But Zacchaeus came into the presence of the Lord. And when he came to the Lord, he started confessing. He said, if I took anything from anybody unjustly, I'm going to restore it to him fourfold. He wanted to make a difference in his life. Can we have that kind of effect on our world? Not that we're holier than anybody else. We're only here because God's forgiven us. Such were some of you. We've all got situations and issues in our life. You're going to come to me today, but I'm going to have to come to you tomorrow because we all have problems. We all have issues. We all have failures. But the Lord gave us a pathway the church has got to love one another. We don't just come together to worship together and hear the word together, but we come to help one another be healed. The effectiveness, the effectiveness of our prayer will be increased and the unity of our church will be increased and another weapon will be removed from the devil's arsenal when we begin to treat failure in one another. In one another. I, I will submit this to you for your thought processes and you thought the Lord will cause you to start praying for somebody's sin and failure before they ever even tell you about it. The, this is going to be a part of the culture of our church is we're going to be able to be trusted with people's failure, not to damn them and condemn them, but they'll be changed and inspired because the same thing is operating in us. God has delivered us. God has forgiven us, not that we might look down on others, but that we might help lead others to Jesus Christ. I ask you right now to pray with us. Lord, I pray that there's a culture of trust, forgiveness, unity, and restoration that will be birthed in our church and those that are watching us. I pray, God, that uh, there will be a, a baptism of forgiveness that begins to flow from heaven to the Riverbend Pentecostals and to the members of the Riverbend and the worshipers at the Riverbend. God, where we will begin to help one another and encourage one another and pray for one another that we may be healed. Lord, and when that healing comes, then there's effectual fervent prayer from righteous men and women. Lord, that have your righteousness imputed unto us and the effects and the, the ramifications of our sins are healed. God, it doesn't mean that the sin never happened. It doesn't mean that we may not have to pay a price, but it means that there is healing and that there is restoration. And God, failure is not the focus but victory is the focus. So we do not establish people's reputations on their failures, but God, let our reputation be established that we are restorers, that we preach restoration, that we preach reconciliation, and that there is no sin that is too big for the blood of Jesus Christ to deliver them and not only set them free for salvation purposes, but heal them for effective purposes in the kingdom of God. I pray again for the sick, the afflicted, the downhearted, the downtrodden. I pray, God, that our church can be a city set on a hill, that we can be the light of the world, and that we can lead people to you, and that many through us might be saved because of the mercy and the truth and the grace that is manifested to us and magnified through us. Let it be in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I want to ask you, if you're watching us, please share this on your page. I want to ask you to watch it again. Pull up your Bible and, and prayerfully peruse these scriptures and this passage. Confess your faults one to another. We all have them. And they separate us from God. And they cause us to be separated from others. And they make us fearful. And they make us hesitant and uncertain. But healing is coming. Healing is coming to the river bend. We love you. God bless you. We look forward to being with you again soon. If you need me, call. Reach out to us on Facebook. Text us. Whatever the case may be. We love you. God bless you.